Minnesota Twins pitcher Kyle Gibson shares the mindset he has both on. It's easy to look at yourself as an ERA or a strikeout total and kind of determine your worth. And off the field. You have to be able to leave those lies behind. My identity is in Christ. Plus, a worker feels trapped in her job. I just got extremely stressed out. I had anxiety. I made myself sick. See how she found freedom. I just jumped up and started praising God. All on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. A billboard in Dallas, Texas has sparked controversy and backlash as it promotes the destruction of human life as self-care. The billboard features three African-American women with a tagline that says, black women take care of themselves by taking care of their families. Abortion is self-care, it reads. The ad is paid for by the Dallas Advocacy Group, which focuses on black women's reproductive rights and health. Well, many protesters use social media to express their outrage over the ad saying it advertises abortions like a day at the spa. Former Planned Parenthood director Abby Johnson said, the abortion war against black women is so real. The Dallas Advocacy Group says they were responding to a billboard message a pastor put up last month that said, abortion is not health care. It hurts women and murders their babies. Well, what do you think about that? <laughs> Um, I think Planned Parenthood from the beginning was targeting minorities. Yeah. Um, Margaret Sanger wrote about that. She wrote about it extensively. Uh, it was all part of the eugenics movement. I think there's a reason Planned Parenthood clinics are in poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the geographic uh, distribution. So, yes, it's trying to reduce the birth rate. Uh, in minority populations. That's that's what it's trying to do. Only the populations understood that. Yeah. Well, another in the issue of abortion, Oprah's O Magazine recently published an article in its inspiration section that has also sparked controversy. It's written by the founder of the Shout Your Abortion movement, Amelia Bono. Amelia shares why abortion is normal and how she has no regrets. She also urges mothers who ended their children's lives to tell their abortion story. The movement started, started after Amelia shared on Facebook her gratitude to Planned Parenthood. Her friend tweeted a screenshot of the Facebook post, including the hashtag and the tweet went viral. People all over the world started tweeting about their abortions, turning the viral hashtag into a full-blown movement. Well, we want to share just a few of the disturbing tweets in this movement. One, my abortion was gentle, irreverent, and empowering. Two, if ever pregnant, I will have an abortion. I lay claim to my own life, that life and that life will not include giving birth. Three, no traumatic backstory. Didn't want kids, couldn't afford kids. Contraceptive failure with casual BF, not one regret. There are some opponents that are also speaking up using the hashtag online, saying things like, I was 21 and homeless when I was pregnant with my daughter. Her father and I are now happily married. It was a rough journey, but she's worth it. Hashtag shout for life, hashtag pro-life. Instead of shouting your abortion, next time shout my way, and I will gladly take your unwanted child. I've been trying for years to have a child and would love nothing more than to love the child you want to abort and shout about. Uh, and this just sort of underlines the debate within our culture. Is a life in a womb uh, a person? And if it is, then uh, does that person enjoy all the rights uh, that you and I enjoy, including the right to life? Um, and that is the underlying debate. Uh, and we'll see. Medical science seems to be pushing back that envelope. And the more you look at these wonderful 3D pictures coming of developing children, uh, you absolutely realize their expressions on their faces, uh, they're sucking their thumbs, and all of this uh, within the first uh, five months, four months uh, exactly. of, of pregnancy. And you look at viability now, um, uh, certainly from, from my point of view, uh, the quicker we can get to, let's ban these late stage. Yes. Uh, let's yes. ban partial birth. Uh, let, let's get, get that one done. Uh, and then let science, uh, if you will, guide us as to when does that beating heart mean 
this is a person. Well, and let's let's get some medical response to when the mother's life is threatened. By the time a child is at that stage, the mother's life is not threatened. And to think of tearing apart limb for limb a child that's well-developed and could be viable outside the womb. Is, and capable yes. of feeling pain. Oh, yes. And, uh, anyway. Well, a pastor's wife from Inland Hills Church in California is grieving after her husband, Andrew, committed suicide after struggling with depression and anxiety. Kayla Stockline shared a letter to her husband that she wrote on their shared blog, God's Got This. In the letter, Kayla shares her pain, shock, and the devastating effects of his depression, writing, you were right all along. I truly didn't understand the depths of your depression and anxiety. I didn't understand how real and how relentless the spiritual attacks were. The pain, the fear, and the turmoil you must have been dealing with every single day is unimaginable. The enemy knew what an amazing man you were. The enemy knew God had huge plans for your life. The enemy saw how God was using your gifts, abilities, and unique teaching style to reach thousands of lives for him. The enemy hated it, and he pursued you incessantly taunting you and torturing you in ways that you were unable to express to anyone. I'm so sorry you were unable to fully get the help and support you needed. Well, Andrew's death has received a lot of attention online, especially from fellow pastors who say they too struggle with mental health and don't feel like they get the support needed. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression or even having thoughts of suicide, please reach out to your local church or call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number's on the screen, 1-800-273-8255. Uh, and Terry, I've got to ask the question. It, it seems there is a rise yeah, in suicide. I, I was about to say and the same I, thing. I think the statistics are supporting that. Uh, and it makes you wonder why. Well, your heart is broken for this young mom and they have beautiful children and, and she's left behind, not just with the day to day and future of that, but the why that I think is so hard for people who've experienced this to just kind of look at when, you know, the answer is really just someone needed help. It wasn't recognized how serious it was and the help didn't get there. Sometimes even getting help doesn't answer the question. You know, we don't seem no. to have, medically speaking, what's needed always for there to be a resolution of this kind of um, severe, really, um, just pain and an emptiness and sense of worthlessness. But what a life lost. Uh, I, I, there, there are a variety of answers to it. Uh, one that was taken up by uh, the wife and her tweet mm -hmm. that this is a spiritual attack. And then there's the answer of, well, there's organically something yes. going on in the brain that needs treatment and can be treated um, by, by medical intervention. Um, and then the third is, what is it about our modern culture where we seem to be overloaded with stimulus that we can't find that peace anymore, mm -hmm. that, that moment of quiet reflection to sort of recharge ourselves? Yeah. If there's, if there's a positive thing that I think is coming out of so many, there's so much increase in this that we've seen, it's that the spotlight is being shined on it and maybe out of that will come some wisdom, some soul searching and, and maybe some lifestyle changes so yeah. that we don't see this. Well, hopefully that will happen. But for those of you who have lost loved ones uh, to yeah. suicide, I've, I've lost friends to suicide and you never get to the answer why. You don't. Uh, you never, you never get there, and at some point you have to rely on Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God, um, but what has been revealed to us is for us and the generations following us. So let's follow what has been revealed, and one day we'll get an answer. Well, many celebrities are speaking out to decrease the stigma associated with living with a mental illness. Here's parts of a video that have gone viral with over six million views. I have suffered from anxiety and or depression since I was 18. Um, what I would say to my younger self is don't be fooled by this game of perfection that humans play. Everyone has problems. Everyone feels yucky on the inside sometimes. And you deserve to feel just as beautiful on the days you wear no makeup and the days you don't shower and the days you feel like you're depressed.
I was diagnosed with PTSD at 19 after I was raped at gunpoint and I didn't let it stop me. I didn't, I didn't want it to define my whole life and it doesn't have to. Asking for help, needing help, doesn't make you weak or less worthy of love or support or success. You can literally be anything you want to be. Um, PTSD isn't a death sentence. But since I was little, I carried around a secret, and the secret was sometimes I felt really anxious, and sometimes the anxiety would feel overwhelming, and I didn't know what to do about it, and I didn't really talk to anybody about it because I felt ashamed, so it's been my secret. I finally found some help, a therapist and a doctor who helped me figure out what it was and took all the shame out of it. And now I realize that it's because I take things in and because of the way my insides work and that instead of being something I'm afraid of or that you should be afraid of, it's your superpower. I went through depression, anxiety, and eating disorder and a lot of confusion because I didn't know what was going on and I felt very alone and weird. I still struggle with anxiety and depression today, but I've learned to admire it and value it because it makes me see the world in a different way. I feel everything all the time and although that's overwhelming, it's also super strong and I get to be creative and empathetic and a really good friend, a good listener, compassionate. Um, and I think that you have to think about those things and it makes us unique and also able to help others. And that is the one of the key. Your weakness can become a strength. Yeah. It's not I'm not going to say it's a superpower, but it can be a strength because it does give you the compassion uh, where you can help other people. Uh, once you've gone through it, once you've gotten the help you need, well, then turn around and help those who are following. And I think what you said is key, and you heard it in all of those stories. Get help. If, if yeah. you feel overwhelmed by anything, about anything, get help. There are people who can help you walk through that. And it doesn't mean you're weak. It actually makes your, means yeah. you're strong enough to look it in the face. And, and say, I hope as a society we get rid of the stigma. Here, here. Uh, the, uh, please get help. Mm -hmm. And we all need help. We all hurt. We all have bad yep. days. None of us are perfect. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're all in the same boat together. And the quicker we can reach out to help, the more we'll find out these problems are common. Yes. Uh, they, they affect us all. Yep. And so we need us all to help. Well, 18-year-old Paige Hunter has struggled with depression herself and is now working to help others. Take a look. Well, Paige hopes the 16 million people who viewed this video online will be inspired to speak out 
and or reach out. What a, what a creative. And, and or copy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what a great thing to do. Yes. And yeah. uh, there are places in the world that are famous for suicide. They yeah. seem to be magnets for it. And, and Wouldn't to it be do great this to proactively, post, yeah, to it's really, it. go page. Yeah, wonderful. Well, coming up, Minnesota's starting pitcher Kyle Gibson reveals what's going on through his mind every time he takes the hill. You have to be able to leave those lies behind um, because the more you start believing in those lies, the less you're going to believe in the actual truths about yourself. The Twins Ace takes us inside the game within the game when we come back. Well, Kyle Gibson's slider has been called one of the sneakiest pitches in all of baseball, but he's quick to say that he needs more than that to succeed in the pros. Recently, he was joined in the Twins dugout by CBN's Tom Buring and shared about how he gets ready for the game. Kyle Gibson doesn't just make his pitch. The Minnesota Twins starting pitcher targets the game inside the game, arming his heart, mind, and emotion while the six-year veteran takes the stage in baseball's performance-based business. From the time where uh, I'm sitting in my locker when I'm listening to, to worship music, honestly, and really trying to make sure that my heart's in the right spot. I always feel like that that circle out there, it's not who I am, it's just part of what I'm here to do. And I'm gonna face a lot of situations throughout the game that if my heart's not in the right spot, the decision I make is probably gonna be a bad decision. What you said for what you might face, do I then presume that that's anxiety? Sure. Is that fear? It's all the above, you know, it, uh, it's a stressful situation where if you're not prepared for it, you could make the wrong decision pitch-wise. It could be, you know, maybe you have to show grace after an error in the field or you have to you know, show a little bit of humility after a home run. You just want to make sure that your mind and heart's in the right spot. Next to the arm, what is the most critical component to be a successful starting pitcher? <sighs> if you talk to 10 people, you might get 10 different answers. You know, I think the legs are important. I think, you know, the torso is important. Over the last year and a half, I really kind of feel like uh, the mind is probably the next important thing. You know, you can feel as good as you want, but if you get that mind right, it just changes everything. You can have the confidence behind what you're doing, and if, if I don't have the confidence in the pitch that I'm going to be throwing, uh, I might as well not throw it. What do you think would surprise us the most? How sometimes it's difficult to handle situations that you can't control. In this park in the summer, obviously you can't control which way uh, the wind is blowing. Uh, and sometimes a routine fly ball to right becomes a home run, and sometimes a uh, home run to left becomes a routine fly ball. So once you throw the ball, you can't control if that umpire misses the call or gives you a call. Being able to, to handle those situations constantly that you have no control over is pretty tough. Has that been helpful for you in your Christ following? In times, I think it's just like a lot of things in life, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. You know, it's really my love from Christ that helps me in those other situations. It's the grace that He's given me that allows me to hopefully show grace most of the time on the mound and do that in my relationship, you know, versus practicing that on the mound and taking it home. And as soon as you release that ball, there is that surrender. Yeah, you have to be able to be okay sometimes with results that aren't mm -hmm. what you planned on. And one of them is you can easily get caught up in numbers in this game. And it's easy to look at yourself as an ERA or a strikeout total and kind of determine your worth. How have you been freed from that? Oh, wow, that's a good question. One of the lies that, you know, uh, has been tough for me to get rid of, but I've had to get rid of is I can't think of myself as an ERA or even a jersey number or anything like that because it's just a lie. My identity is in Christ, and that's really my identity. You have to be able to leave those lies behind um, because the more you start believing in those lies, the less you're going to believe in the actual truths about yourself. What does the Christ follower and the elite competitor have in common? I think they can have everything in common. Paul is one of my favorite guys to read uh, from the Bible just because of everything he went through. And he talked multiple times about running the race and everybody that runs the race is supposed to run to win. You complete it as if you're completing a task from God. There was a couple times where I started showing a little bit more emotion on the field. And one talk that I had with you know, our GM and uh, another one of our front office, and, and they said, listen, we know that you're a man of faith and those things don't have to separate. I think they're as intertwined as you want them to be. You know, walk off the mound and do everything with as much love as possible, and sometimes having that little competitive edge isn't a bad thing. Got to get you a tearaway jersey. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> That'd go that's over right. well. <laughs> possibly not, but I like <laughs> it. Possibly not. I have a lot of explaining to do. I've noticed when you sign, you will add a scripture. What is that scripture and why? So Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. As good of representation of the gospel and what I'm really trying to do in life as I found. 
Christians. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. It's a gift from God. We are God's handiwork, mm -hmm. created by Him to do the good works that He set out in advance for us to do. This is what I'm here to do. You know, I'm, I've been put here to put this verse and, and to do the work that God set out in advance for me to do. Now, those are words to live by in the middle of any mistake or any pressure situation you're facing. Remember those words. You are God's handiwork. Uh, and he is right there, ready, willing, and able to assist you in anything you're doing. Uh, there's a reason the Holy Spirit is called our helper, and let him come and help you today. Mm -hmm. Terry? Well, still to come, a new boss makes a young worker miserable. I had anxiety. I just absolutely dreaded, you know, waking up the next day to go to work. I couldn't sleep. See how she finds a supernatural answer to her problem. Plus, we're going to be praying for you. That's next. After a new boss took over, Lori Vaughn felt trapped in a job she hated. The stress got so bad it literally made her sick. Lori thought she was stuck until she received a supernatural answer to her desperate prayers. Lori Vaughn had always loved her job at a local insurance agency. I answered the phones and took payments and just basically managed the whole office. It was awesome. I had a wonderful boss. He was great to me and I loved coming in. Then her boss retired. His replacement started making a lot of changes in the way they did their jobs. Things were going smoothly at first, but as months went on, I just, it just started to, to get to me. And now, at least once a week, Lori was required to work at the sister office over an hour away. Everything in the office was just changing completely, you know, going to the different location, missing my small town people, and it was very different than it was before. It didn't feel like home anymore. I just got extremely stressed out. I started hating my job. The stress started to affect her life at home. At home, I... I had anxiety. I just absolutely dreaded, you know, waking up the next day to go to work. I looked forward to the weekend more than I ever did in my life. I couldn't sleep. I just, I made myself sick. Lori thought about looking for another job, but feared her lack of college education would hinder her possibilities. I didn't get the education that I should have. I played around. I just felt like everything was just over my head. For two months, she prayed for God to show her His plan for her life. I kept asking Him to speak to me and to let me know what to do, and I prayed for Him to have His will in my life. One Friday morning, Lori was ready to quit. My boss had just told me the day before that he wanted me to be at the other location three days a week. So I was very emotional. I felt like I was abandoning my customers. And I just, I just knew it was time to move on. Like every morning, Lori turned on the 700 Club at her desk. So Terry and Gordon were praying. Now, someone else, you are so discontented with your job, uh, and you blame yourself because you didn't get education when you could have and should have. You just played instead. God's got something fresh for you. Stop looking at what you don't have and begin to thank Him before you even see it. It's on the way. I just jumped up and started praising God. I was crying. So that right there was all I needed to know because that was my personal private prayer with God. And I just, I felt peace. I knew that that was God letting me know I was going to be okay. Tuesday of the very next week, Lori interviewed with another insurance agency near her home and was offered the job that same day. It's better atmosphere. The women I work with, they're Christians too. And it's close to home, so there's no travel and I'm going to be at one office. Today, Lori has passed the test to become an insurance agent with her new company and enjoys spending time with her family. She's giving all the praise to God. He's given me peace. I just feel peace and um, I just know that He wants me there. I don't know what He's going to do, but I know He's, he's going to take care of me. 
He's been good to me my entire life. I hope you know that, that God is going to take care of you. I love when God speaks through words of knowledge, something that's so personal about someone's prayer or their need or their thought process that they know it's for them. Today, God knows your name, He knows your need, and we wanna take some time to pray for you and let the Holy Spirit just give you that peace that surpasses all understanding as you wait on the Lord. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, we lift all of those oh, right now who are suffering with any kind of anxiety, any kind of depression, any kind of need, wondering what's their worth, why are they here? And we just ask that you would come down and be their very present help in time of trouble that you would show up in their lives and let them know that they are worth the sacrifice you paid for them, that you came just for them, that you left the 99 to come seek for the one, and that one is them. Give them this assurance, Lord God. Give it to them now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, even as Gordon was praying, there are some of you who have, you've made some foolish choices in your life and you feel so much like it, like it can't be redeemed, like God can't take the mess that you're in and restore it, that there's no open door for you. You are wrong. Today is the beginning of that turnaround. Lift your hands up right now. Begin to praise the Lord. Say, yes, God, I will receive everything you have for me. I will walk through the door into the purposes of your making. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We leave you with this word from Romans, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.